Hey, welcome back. In this video, I'm breaking down my hierarchy system for leveraging heart rate, pace, and power. Despite what the experts have told you, you can't just rely on one metric. With my hierarchy system, I'll show you how you can use heart rate, pace, and power to optimize every run and race to ensure you're not throwing away that precious training time. As a bonus, I'll show you how I use the oldest of old school metrics, climb, along with the newest GPS functionality that pretty much no one knows about to smash track workouts. If you're a regular viewer around here, you know that I love training zones, exercise intensities, and we can reference the exact same thing. If you've ever blown up in a race or boxed yourself on some intervals, you know that in order to pace ourselves appropriately, we need to work within our physiological limits. Using my hierarchy system in collaboration with training zones, you get a reliable system for maximizing your training and racing. Within this video, I'm going to be referencing my seven training zone system. So if you haven't already, you can check out my training zones how-to guide downloadable in the description or the calculators on my website to get your training zones pretty sorted. So let's get into my hierarchy system. When I'm prescribing a workout or a race, I'll always have a key metric that sets the tone and dictates the intensity of the workout. So whatever that is, pace, heart rate, power, it's all gonna depend on what the workout is and what's the goal of either the race or the session. Because we can't just rely on one metric, having another metric underlying it as a secondary or even tertiary metric, we get the full scope of what is happening physiologically. All right, let's start with heart rate. So heart rate's the tool that I'm gonna be utilizing in zones one to three. See, heart rate, I kind of consider the dial-up broadband of metrics. It does well with a slow, steady state of information, but doesn't do so well with fast rates of change. Zones one to three are typically about reducing stress. So whether that's in a zone two run and we're trying to maximize our aerobic capacity and minimize the utilization of carbohydrates and anaerobic metabolism, or it's a zone one easy recovery run, it could also be the start of a marathon where we want to make sure that we take into account for something like an altitude change or temperature, humidity, the terrain. We want to make sure that there's a ceiling there and that we're not going out too hard despite what pace or power may be telling us. Our heart rate is going to give us the best indication of physiological or internal metabolic load. Then as we start to go beyond zone three into zone four plus, Heart rate doesn't do so well because as I said before, it's a little slow because it relies on the uptake, transport and utilization of oxygen. And as we start to step into zone four, we start to have an anaerobic metabolism. That leads us on to pace, the most universally understood metric of them all. It's because it can be referenced in absolute terms. And everyone pretty much knows what you mean. You say a seven minute mile, people can go, yeah, I know what that means. I know how long that would take you to complete a certain distance. And I know if that's easy or hard for me or for a runner of your caliber. The thing is, it's not very well referenced relatively. See, everything is relative to our threshold. So often we say, you know, I'm going to go for a zone two run. If we're doing that in a pace based system, so pace is going to be our primary metric, let's say for a zone two. What if you start doing it on trail over undulating terrain? Pace starts to get pretty murky and no doubt you're running above your actual zone two, trying to stay in a pace zone on the hills. And then you're probably going a little bit too slow on the downhills. And now you've just kind of entered the gray zone. That's why heart rate is going to be the primary metric there. So all we can use pace for within zone three short efforts or the early stages of a long effort is to just make sure we're immediately dialed into the pace and the exact zone that we require. We pretty much can do it off of feel if you're an experienced runner, but in the early stages of a marathon, look, heart rate may be sky high. It also may be super low as you build into your effort. That could be three, four hours worth. So in the early stages, we can just check pace to know that, yep, this is about right. We can do the same thing with power if we're that way inclined. And that's where within a zone three, we can work with heart rate and pace to make sure that we are absolutely maximizing our training time within those zones otherwise if you're just relying on heart rate you could quickly overshoot the mark to get up to the required heart rate which could be exceeding the demands or specificity of that interval or workout but then as we get into zone four plus pace is going to be really good unless we're doing hill repeats we'll get onto that with power so with pace in zone four and up we're trying to target specific metabolic requirements if we want to run a sub 40 10k we need to run at an intensity that's going to elicit the demands of a sub 40 10k. But if you don't live in a dead flat area, pace could be a little murky to represent your true effort. 
and that's where I'd like to introduce running power. I'd be considered an early adopter of running power. I've used it since about 2015 when Stride started to come onto the scene. So a lot of you have probably seen running power popping up on your watch in some recent updates or if you upgraded your device. But there's no universal metric. We can't all compare different devices because everyone uses their own algorithm. Garmin, for example, takes into account the energy return from your lower limb spring into their power number. So they're always going to be 20-25% higher than the likes of a Chorus, Apple or Stripe. But that doesn't mean that it's not useful. So at this stage, there's only two scenarios where I'd recommend power as your primary metric. One is if you have the next gen stride power meter and two is any time you're going uphill. The next gen stride pod has been about the fifth in the generation and I've bought it, I've paid for it, it's not endorsed. And it's finally the point where I can utilize it across all terrains and distances. But I can't say so much for the, the wrist based ones at this stage. But most of you aren't going to have a stride power meter. So how do you use it in terms of running uphill or guiding your training and racing? So as soon as you start to go uphill, you need to have an understanding of what your running power threshold is and how these numbers then relate. As you start to head uphill, your device's inbuilt barometer will detect the pressure change and your number, your power number, will start to increase reflecting the increase in metabolic and muscular work that you are doing to run up the hill. Having an understanding of where you, that number sits within your threshold is going to allow you to pace your races and your efforts within training more accurately. So let's paint the scene of an undulating marathon. In the early stages of the marathon, first hour for sure, I want to be looking at heart rate as my primary metric. Heart rate's going to tell me whether I'm working too hard in the conditions and over the course so that I am not burning too much carbohydrate, I'm not entering into too much anaerobic work early on in the marathon that's going to cause me problems later. Then in a close second, I'm looking at pace. Obviously, I'm going to have a time goal in my mind that I want to achieve because that's just how we work, right? So I want to get as close to or on that pace for the lowest possible heart rate. So heart rate and pace are working very closely together in the early stages of the marathon. Then we have running power. When we're going up these inclines, we want to make sure that our running power number is not going over our threshold. So if the undulation is not that big, heart rate's not really going to increase because of that supply and demand lag that I talked about. And then if you're looking at pace and you're trying to keep that in the goal, you could be overworking without realizing it and power is going to paint that picture. I wrote a blog on this about how Steve ruined his sub three hour attempt, which you can check out. I'll link to that in the description. So as you move through the race and go beyond that one hour mark, you can start to increase your heart rate limit and start to look more at pace becoming your primary metric because you have that time goal in mind. And once you get to two hours, you just need to try and get yourself in the hurt box get yourself to the finish line and for more on that you can check out the blogs on my website or the training zones how-to guide which i've put in the description and now as promised how i use the oldest of old school metrics time with the newest gps functionality to smash track workouts look gps can't do corners it can't do tight turns remember this is a measurement from space so our pace is kind of all off on the track what i always use is just time the oldest old school 100, 200, 300, 400 meter split times, then most watches, if not all watches that have come out in the last five years, have a track mode function. And this is where it snaps the GPS to the track. So what you can do is you can program in a track mode and you can set an auto lap function. So as you're running round, you'll get a beep and a an notification for every 200 meters to ensure that you are staying on the pace by using something as simple as time. All right, guys, check out some of my past videos. I'll see you on the next one. Hashtag faster with data.